Yanni with everybody and welcome to Aga Khan Social Welfare Board's Parents Support Group meeting. This evening we have Shalina Mitta, speech and language therapist, here with us to answer your questions. Shalina is vastly experienced. She is head of a speech, uh, head of therapy at a specialist college. She's a specialist in autism. Um, she does diagnosis of autism and a senior tutor for the Makaton charity. So I just like to welcome Shalina um, and thank you for joining us this evening. Yali Mother, thank you everybody for your time and joining with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to tackle this in three parts. Um, firstly, I'm going to look at early language development and the barriers to developing healthy speech and language skills. Secondly, I'm going to look at um, some specific questions around stammering. And then thirdly, I'm going to leave space for any other questions that may not be covered in those uh, particular aspects. Super, thank you. We'll let you go ahead. So before we expect any kind of engagement and um, meaningful interaction, we've got to establish that the young person um, is able to listen and attend very well. OK, and sometimes without realizing they might even have a middle ear infection, a mild hearing loss. They might have um, some kind of um, emotional dysregulation that's help that's causing um, them to not take in information or not take in cues from the environment. So I'm trying to build up this um, the pre early precursors for language acquisition. The first is the listening and attention. So as speech and language therapists, we try and in, ensure that um, our young people have um, all the right environment and constitution for the best possible listening and attention, okay? So that could be um, distractions removed, pressures removed, um, anxieties removed, the best possible environment for them to listen and attend. OK, because without that basis for listening and attention, the channels cannot be open for um, language to develop. Once the listening and attention is is really strong and you feel that there are no barriers there, then what we do is we start um, building language through um, symbolic play. So I'm now talking about very early language acquisition. So some of you have mentioned slight sort of delays in the stages of language development. And this does also tie a bit into stammering, but not in every case. So what you do is you have to have special times with your children. You have to dedicate special times for your children to have one-to-one -one with you where you're doing child-directed play child directed interaction and that means you join in what they're doing you follow their lead um so child directed communication is at the basis of all parent child interaction what we call um mother ease how you know when a baby is born starting right from birth um when a when a baby starts cooing or babbling the mother starts copying and joining in and this phenomenon of child-directed communication is at the heart of all language acquisition. When you join in in what the child is motivated about and what the child is doing, they're more likely to build their attention even more, and they're more likely to get more meaning from what you're doing as well. If a child's engaged in something and you don't join in with that, they'll easily lose their engagement with what you're doing and you lose their engagement from what they're doing. And that, that means then there isn't an interaction. So the way that we always advocate, and this will be in the beta Lilms as well, um, for step teachers or for uh, Jamila's um, role, what you need to do is engage with their interests, their motivations, their questions, their what they're starting talking about. And um, when you join in with what they're doing and tuning in with what they're doing, child-led um, language, then you can build and you can grow it. 
But if you start with your own agenda, there's nothing to grow because it's your thing that you're pushing on the child. Okay, so that's the first premise is establish. I'm actually building you a pyramid. We call it the language pyramid. You start with the listening and attention. Then you have the symbolic play. When I talk about symbolic play, which is child directed, join in with their favorite games, their favorite um, miniature toys. Miniature toys in Piagetian theory, miniature toys are essential for developing symbolic knowledge. Words are symbols for the actual referent. So when you want to develop a child's symbolic understanding, you start with miniatures of the actual thing so they recognize that small cow is not the real cow it represents the big cow it's a symbol of the big cow and that when you label it cow you're referring to the actual real life cow and therefore the word cow becomes a symbol that associates that small miniature with the real thing and that learning of the name that psycholinguistics, that's how children learn words. So you start with maybe large toys and then you go to miniatures. And that level of play and interaction is really crucial and critical for those early years for learning language. So now you've got, and I'm really going to go fast with this because I've got lots of specific questions to answer. So you've got the listening and attention, then you've got the symbolic play. Through symbolic play, only through symbolic meaningful interactions comes comprehension. So if you are expecting language from your child, you cannot get language until you get comprehension. Otherwise, it would be like parroting. It would be like repeating or echoing back what someone said. For any speech or language to be meaningful, it would have to have and a level of comprehension, what we call real um, understanding in information carrying words. We call them ICWs. So you're now from listening to attention to symbolic play to now you're sort of narrowing onto the pyramid at the comprehension. And this isn't just situational understanding. Like I can understand what might be happening when I see somebody bringing a coat. I imagine, ah, oh, yes, we must be going outdoors now. There's no language involved. I understand what's happening from the routine, from the nonverbal communication. But verbal comprehension comes in a very staged way. And it's very neat. Zero to one, one year olds don't really have very much linguistic comprehension they have situational understanding they they take cues from the environment they hear a sound of a door open and they know somebody's coming in they hear a kettle boiling and they know someone's going to make some tea you know they they take cues from the environment one to two year olds understand one information carrying word only okay normally developing one year olds will understand one ICW. That means they'll understand if you say table, chair, plate, cup, they'll start understanding single words. Again, you start with a symbolic play. You, you would have a tea set. You would have, you know, try and teach them through miniatures first. They begin to understand single words. One to two, so one to two year olds, single words, two to three year olds understand two ICWs. So if you said, give me the big cup or the green apple, where there's an alternative for green and an alternative for apple. So you might have a red and green um, apple and a red and green, um, you know, another another thing, and, and they would give you the, the right one. So that's two ICWs. Three-year-olds understand three, four-year-olds understand four. It's actually very neat in normal child language development. So my thing is that if you're going up the pyramid and you've gone from listening and attention to then symbolic play to then comprehension, when they get to two or three ICWs, we expect a lot of meaningful expressions, okay? So normally developing children start producing single words between one and one and a half, right? And um, at one and a half, we start expecting them to produce two to three word phrases. 
By two, they're producing short phrases and sentences. And by three, they should be producing conversations. Okay? So that's the norms of um, child language acquisition. And it doesn't just happen by magic. It comes through this process that I'm trying to um, illustrate to you that it comes through the listening attention, then the symbolic play, then linguistic comprehension, and then meaningful expressions. And then only when they start producing these long sentences do we start working on the actual speech sounds and the clarity. We don't start working on phonology, what we call clarity of speech until they've got meaningful expressions. So that's sort of in a nutshell, um, how language develops. Now, there may be certain blocks that prevent that normal process from taking place. As I said, hearing problems can be one where you have recurrent ear infections um, cause otitis media, uh, middle ear effusions, and they may need grommets. Okay. Um, sometimes consist, you know, constant viral infections and colds and coughs block up your ears. And we we actually underestimate how much that distorts the speech mechanism. Okay, so if your child has recurrent colds and ear infections, it would be worth uh, maybe getting um, an examination and maybe getting something if not the antibiotics working, um, grommets to remove that. Some children have to have adenoidectomy, you know, the lymph glands in the nasopharynx, or um, they may need to have tonsillectomy if they get very enlarged lymph no nodes in their, in their pharynx. So um, there are some blocks to speech perception and language development. Um, if you want your child to develop more um, language and there are a few of you who have mentioned this i would say special time of one to one in symbolic play in uh, modifying language to their level of icws if you can assess and if you want me to give you a bit more tips on how to assess their icws the number of information carrying words they understand i can explain to you how to do that then when you know that you can modify your language to that level because if they're at one ICW and you're talking to them with four ICWs, they're not going to be able to process it. So you have to modify your language right down to if the child is at one ICW, you have to modify your language to one plus one, the Vygotsky principle, so that they extend it. So you start talking to them in one to two ICWs to stretch them, to teach them the two right? If they're at two ICWs, your language has to be modeled at two to three ICWs to again stretch them, okay? So I can share that with you in a bit more detail if you want, but modifying your language, supporting it with visuals, with pictures, photos, gestures, signs, um, symbols, objects, use all the multi-sensory cues around you when you modify your language. And we know as practitioners that this sort of strategy just spurs the language on and it makes the child language rich and enables the child to develop much more expression, meaningful expression. I'm not talking about just echoed or repeating back, but words that they've understood because they've gone through that process, okay? So play is a critical, critical part of language development, and we have to set aside time for play. And I, I often give parents ideas of what sort of play to do because some parents, you know, it's natural to them and some parents maybe they haven't got the ideas as much so I, I my role is maybe to say every day some book reading every day some singing every day some brick building every day some bubbles every day some balloons every day some jigsaws just five ten minutes of these little one-to-one -one sessions in these different activities and if a child is having difficulty processing the auditory um, I can give you 
uh, I can email to you some uh, visuals to support your language while you're talking to them to help their attention develop, to help them access your language. OK, and so if that's the sort of thing you you need, um, I know this is a very general session and I'm not even confident that I can um, you'll go away with anything very useful for your own child. But I want to help each one of you. So if you come back to me and you tell me your specific thing, I can maybe tailor it for you. So um, every day you need to do some of these activities just to spur the language on. Now, in that process, another barrier could be um, physical maturity, um, emotional health and emotional um, emotional sort of state uh, that's a barrier and the third one is um, language uh, limited uh, language exposure so some children who don't have enough exposure to different new words or something and sometimes between the period of two and five there's a period of normal non-fluency and so it's quite common for children between the age of two and five to develop a stutter or a stammer it's, it can be called either all right and um if it persists beyond five then you need to really um tackle it in a in a much more um direct way rather than through the ways that i'm you know, said with normal non-fluency, you would work on these three things, making sure that, you know, if there's something that's triggered it, an emotional thing like a moving of a house or a birth of a baby or a bereavement or something, usually there's some emotional trigger for the child. The second thing is maybe neurological maturation. You know, this whole vocal tract is still maturing. Coordination of the vocal tract is still maturing for our children. It's not quite that. It's a bit like it's a motor skill as much as a cognitive skill. And coordinating all of that for a two to five year old can be quite hard. Um, the third thing is language. Um, so what we do is if there's a hesitancy or a repetition or a prolongation or a big pause, um, sometimes it's because the word finding isn't as quick um, as the, the comprehension is really high, but the output is a bit um, more difficult because the retrieval of the word. So you see language, speech and language is quite complex because there's input, there's processing, then there's output. And sometimes the input is the barrier, sometimes the processing is a barrier, and sometimes it's the output that's the barrier. So the output meaning it's a motor plan and it's coordinating what's going from the brain through the vocal tract, and that's a neuromuscular activity. All right. So when it comes to that neuromuscular program, then it's about helping with word retrieval. And this um you know, there's several things that um, um, the research shows, which is that you sort of work on word knowledge by um, these are the, the few things that initial sound, the rhyme, the number of syllables, um, an action that you can do with it. So a gesture or a mime and how you write it. So the, the written text of the word. And if you present words in with all these features of the word, the child neurologically becomes much more um, alert about those words and the retrieval can be easier for that child. OK, so it's it's something we all experience, which is called the tip of the tongue phenomenon as well. This is a phenomenon where you know that you're thinking of a word, you can't find the word. Um, and you or let me give you an example of a name. You might say, oh, I know, I know that person's name. It starts with a K. Um, I know it's something like Carolyn, Carolyn. Is it Carolyn? Oh, no, 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 it's Catherine. Now you can see it starts, the initial sound is the same. The number of syllables is the same. The rhyme is the same, okay? And that's how, um, the brain stores words by the initial sound, the number of syllables, the rhyme, how it's written, so how it appears visually. And uh, the last thing is um, do an action for it. 
if you do an action for it, like if you say a K for Carolyn or Catherine, you're more likely to remember. So if I went around the room and I asked you all to do your initial, you know, in signing, do your initial letter, I'll be more likely to remember your names than if I just hear it. That's just an example. OK, so word learning can be facilitated by these features. This is neuroscience. This isn't just me making this up. OK, and um, if you want to develop your child's speech and language, like step teachers, for example, in the classroom, like Jamila's classroom, what you can do is if, when you're teaching a topic, pick up the key words in the topic, and this will help children with disfluency because word knowledge will give them confidence for the retrieval. Pick up the key words in your topic, write them on the board, and do this, um, what, what I call a word wall, and I create word walls in my classrooms, and I have, um, I have a circle, and I have these features, and I have a spinner. So we go, with the spinner, we go around, okay, how many claps? What's the first sound? What does it rhyme with, etc. I do the whole thing, and by the time they've done the whole thing, and how to write the word next time they're going to remember that word okay so any new vocabulary related to the curriculum or to their functional life do that word wheel if not in a physical word wheel do it in the principles with all the words uh, with all the strategies i've just told you rhyme detection is a very very important predictor for literacy Children who can detect rhyme will develop better reading and spelling skills. That's a fact. Children with a higher receptive and expressive vocabulary will be better readers and spellers. That's a fact. Okay. And also children who are bilingual will be better readers and spellers. And that's a fact. All right. So we know from the research the things that enable speech and language to grow and flourish. So um, when a child is over five or six, I talked about normal non-fluency between two and five. After five, if, the, if it's still persisting and what we call it's moving from being a primary stutterer to being, being a secondary stutterer where the child develops tics or mannerisms or blocks and, and it becomes like facial grimacing or some other physical concomitant behaviors. That's the time to really do much more direct work on it, not just working on word knowledge, not just working on um, their emotional well-being, which is possibly a trigger, like a moving of a house or a big emotional life change. By the way, I didn't say how to address that. To address the emotional side, there are techniques where... Um, you do some relaxation techniques for the children, uh, whether whatever they enjoy, um, but sometimes just long baths with nice calming music and um, uh, maybe massage techniques, you know, massaging, even just massaging the head and the shoulders, the vocal tract. There is a theory that says that stuttering is spasm of the vocal folds. And if that's that, if if that theory is correct, then obviously massaging around the throat, the neck uh, will also help. It will never do any harm in any case. So, you know, if a child is calmer, more relaxed and uh, feeling more um, less, ten less tense, um, they will uh, produce a more clearer speech. But there is another yawn sigh technique that they use for this, people who believe in this theory. They say, if you yawn, Oh, and then sigh, what you're already doing is releasing all that tension around the vocal tract. So what you can do is a yawn sigh technique or a stretch and then a yawn and then a sigh. And by the time you've let go of all that tension that you put in with the stretch, the yawn and the sigh, by that time, you've let go of the tension. And what they say is that if you allow the child to speak on the exhalation, they're not going to stammer because you're going to go, oh, hello, my name is Shalina. And I'm exhaling and I'm speaking on my exhaled breath. 
and I won't stammer on my Excel bread. Now, these are just some of the techniques that are out there. Unless I assess a child, I can't recommend a specific technique, but I'm giving you some general things. And um, the other thing that uh, for emotional is um, just acknowledging your children's feelings and being attentive and present when they're having um, any tension around them and noticing it and just being with them, um, just being quiet, not having to talk too much during that period, just allowing them to not, not have the pressure of talking and just, you know, relaxing. So find some strategies for relaxing. Reading to your children is a really good thing because it's a double hit. One, that you're relaxing together and two, that you're introducing lots of new vocabulary and building their language through the books. OK, so if you take away nothing from this session today, except that read, 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 read to your children in a very loving, relaxed way. Honestly, you will make a difference for the rest of your ch child's life by even just introducing more reading into your routine. So um, another interesting fact about stammering is, is that children don't stammer when they sing. Uh, adults don't stammer when they sing. Um, you know, Rowan Atkinson, he's a stammerer, but Mr. Bean doesn't do a lot of talking, does he? Right? And um, when, when you sing, you're using a different air uh, breathing mechanism and you're, you're using a different breathing pattern. So what's happening is, um, you, you know, the airflow and the tempo is different. So Disfluency is a disorder of timing. It's, it's called a disorder of timing. So when you do that, when you do the singing, it will um, ease the stammering. But I'm not going to um, claim that that will help your specific child because as a speech and language therapist, I would have to assess each child and then give you some specific advice on on your child this is just really a general uh conversation we're having um so we're looking to get my four-year-old started on some speech therapy and i just wanted to ask whether the michael paling method is advisable or whether yes. the Lincoln method is advisable um so they're both good they're both good um they both have good outcomes. They both have good research. It's really your preference. I can't say one is better than the other. Um, it's really a parental choice. They're just different methods. In terms of outcomes, have you sort of noticed one kind of giving a better outcome than the other or? Well, actually, yeah, Lidcombe has really, really good outcomes. Okay. Um, Michael Palin does have good outcomes, but they do it in a different way. Um, Lit, the difference is Lidcombe is very direct. It, it, it tackles it head on yeah. and it says, oh, your speech is bumpy or it's a bit, you know, they use words to describe the speech and bring it to the child's conscious level of, of, of awareness. What uh, Michael Palin Center is a little bit different in that they, they give the child more time, they give the child more patience, um, they don't try and draw too much awareness, direct awareness of the speech to um, to the conscious level because they they want the child to feel this. They work on the child's self esteem and they don't want the child to feel that they're a stammerer. But the Lidcombe approach is an Australian approach is very much well. We should tell the child that bit was bumpy. That bit, they use these words, you know, yeah. and. Um, they're, they're, they're just different in their philosophy. They both have good outcomes. Okay. Did you want to ask anything else? Thank you. You're welcome. We have a hand up from Hamida. Hamida, is there something you wanted to ask? Hello. Hi, Hamida. Hi, Yali Mother. Yali Mother. Uh, I have got one question. Actually, my daughter is nine years old. She's been in Jamila's class before uh, when she was in Beitulin, when she started. 
she was delayed in speech. We were really worried, me and my husband, because she was first child and we were worried has she got autism, why she's not talking, why she's delayed in her speech. Uh, I took her to speech and language therapy, nothing worked. And suddenly when she started reception, she got her speech and she's nonstop now. She says dua, she says ginan, she says farman in jamaat khana. She, she, she is very good with it. So I, I, I'm very confident she's doing well. But now when my son was born five years after her, he's in Jamila's class. Um, he was very good with his speech. Like he, he developed his speech when he was one year old. He was saying the words. When he was two, he was saying two to three words, which was, you know, I, I thought it's quite good. But then when she went in, he went in Jamila's class, I was raised a concern that we are finding it hard to understand what he's saying. Then I sat with him and I realized that, you know, he has got a lot of words to say, but then he tries to say it so quickly that sometimes I can understand because I'm with him all the time being as a parent, but others might be finding it hard because he's trying to say it very quickly. So how can I help? him to try and understand to slow down his speech because I've told him a couple of times that Aima or other other people don't I don't so he's doing it to understand but uh, because the concern was raised I was worried my husband was worried because we have gone through it so we were worried that is there anything which we can do to help him uh, which can benefit everyone. Okay, how old did you say he is now? Nine? He He's, he, no, my son has turned four. Four, sorry. My daughter was Your daughter nine. is nine. Yeah. Yeah. So he's turned four. So actually he's still quite little and he's trying to run before he can walk, right? He's trying to get his words out really quickly. Um, yeah. Is, is he quite, is he quite um, uh, trying to do everything in that, at that pace? Like, all his he's work. very yeah he is very active and he yeah. wants to do everything quickly okay. he's got loads of his speech like uh he's got loads of words and vocabularies which okay. i don't expect like uh, he sometimes comes up with the words which i don't expect him to say at this stage which okay, he does. So in that case what we need to do is help him to do a bit more listening and just listening and process because you know i told you there's input processing and output and he's all at the output right and maybe he's not spending enough time with the listening and the processing yeah you see because he's just got so many ideas he just wants to just get them out right now there's an approach which i would really recommend which is called yeah. the listening program what it is is it it's acoustically modified music the child listens to it for 15 minutes a day, right? Okay. It makes them stop. It makes them stop all this activity that they've got. It makes them concentrate better. It makes them attend better. And so when they're talking, they're also a bit more calmer when they're talking. Sure. Right? This listening program, you can get, um, you can you can subscribe to it. You can get it as an app on your phone or you can buy the mp3 with the music on it and it's acoustically modified music that uh, is um, designed to stimulate certain frequencies in the cochlea when the cochlea is stimulated in at these certain frequencies and this yeah. will also help stammering this is a very very useful treatment for stammering that um, it helps children um, at different pitch frequencies. So the high frequencies help you with executive function, cortical activity, focus, concentration, to be able to finish a task, finish a piece of work, which your son might benefit from that sort of thing if he's very, very fast at doing everything, right? And um, the middle frequencies are for the speech. And then the low frequencies are for your body awareness, so the motor skills, 
you know, how you're moving, you're grounding, it grounds you, it gives you proprioception, it helps you know what your body's doing in space. And as I said, two to five year olds are maturing neurologically in all these areas. So for this age group, the listening program does a really wonderful job, has really good outcomes, um, really evidence based. But um, that's one suggestion. And um, another suggestion, which might work, might not work, is to record him. Okay, so sometimes when you record a child's speech and you say, okay, let me see if I can work out what you say, say it again, I'm going to record you. And then you both listen to it together. And you say, now tell me, and then you stop and start. So we'll do it in three bits. Let's do the first bit. What was the first bit? And then he hears it and he tells you, what was the second bit? So then he hears it and tells you, now that feedback loop that he's getting of his own speech will help him modify his speech, right? So I found that very helpful, recording a child's speech and then listening back together. Because all of us, we can't hear our own mistakes, not just children. None of us can hear our own mistakes, but other people can see or hear our own mistakes right? And we're very good at picking other people's mistakes, but we're not good at knowing our own mistakes. So this sort of feedback loop that you can give them through recording can make quite a difference. And I do use that technique. I got it. I think we'll try with this as well. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? There was a, there was one in the chat. Um, I'll cream. I don't know if you want me to read it out or whether you'd like to just uh, pipe up. Um, yeah, um, Shalina. Yeah, I think when he was younger, uh, he's five now. He was two then. He had a bit of disfluency. Yeah. Um, and um but his vo his vocabulary and phrasing was very good even then yes I um, and it's now he's five it's still good right and he has good language etc but every single sentence pretty much uh, uh and through a sentence there's a lot of breaks right a lot of ums mm -hmm. as he's kind of thinking about the thing he's going to say um so it's it's quite frequent not always but fairly regularly. Um, so I'm wondering whether now, as you talk about that five-year period where now it's worth getting more specialist kind of... Uh... I would I would advise that at this stage now because two to five, we tend to deal with it by tackling indirectly the language, the mm. physical and the emotional. Those are the three main sources of normal non-fluency. After five... Um, and if it's becoming quite um, a feature of his speech and language, what you don't want is to, it to become part of his self-image. Because the thing with stuttering is it becomes part of your identity as you get older and you start thinking of yourself as a stammerer as you get older. You know, it becomes part of like your who you are. And what um, you need to do is... Um, Try some of the methods like the listening program that I've suggested. Try um, a specialist in stammering. If you can try and access a specialist in that. And um, have you tried Lidcom? No. No. Um, I mean, I think Lidcom is worth trying. Um, but I think it, it's go to a specialist um, in stammering and um, ask them to explain to you all the differences in the different approaches that they've got. And um, it, even if you do uh, one, one or the other of those approaches, the listening program is still worth doing for Thank him you. because it's a, a stammering is a disorder of timing, as I said to you. And what the acoustically modified music does is it gives you a metronome a metronome is a really good, in fact, you could download a, a free metronome app. I've got one on my phone and I use it in therapy. And what the children have to do is they have to follow your beats like this. 
and then you change the beat and they have to follow your beat. That tunes in their timing. They get their timing. So it's interesting you say that because we, we I remember about a, a eight, nine months ago, we took him to a kind of music class. Uh huh. And he did struggle to, the, the, the right. teacher was playing piano and he wasn't doing it to the beat. Whereas right. the other kids right. were. Right. Okay. There's a sign for you. There's a sign. Try that metronome. And I can't turn it off now and it's going to bug me like anything. Um, what the metronome does is it helps tune in a person's listening, basically. It's to, to train their listening. And, and it's about timing. And speech is about rhythm and time. You know, like if you say banana, banana, banana is the second syllable, which is has the stress on it. Like, uh, let me give you a word that we get confused. Development. Can you all say that word for me? Development. 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 Which syllable in that word is the stressed syllable? V. Development. It's the second syllable which is stressed. But a lot of people say development. Don't they? Development. They stress the third syllable, especially in our Indianized community pronunciation. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that speech has a rhythm and a timing. And we, can, we have some stressed syllables and we have some unstressed syllables. My name, Shelina, my first syllable this time, but in my workplace, it's Shalina, Shalina. They say it differently, all right? So what I'm trying to say is, is that we have a musicality in speech. We have a stress and a rhythm in our speech. These are called suprasegmental features of speech. And the suprasegmental features are what's affected in stammering. So try the metronome, try the listening program, get a specialist speech and language therapist to start working with him. It's not my area of specialism. Great, thank you, Shalina. You're very welcome. Shalina, um, happy yeah. dollar, Bob, one question. Yeah. Um, the listening program, can you recommend an app? Do you use an app at all? Yes, it, they have their own app. But as I say, you have to subscribe to get it. It's not a free app and uh, you have to have the special equipment to listen to it. You have to have a special bone conduction earphone. It's a special earphone that you'd need. Maybe I can, you can share details and we can- I do that, yeah. I, if, to... if you're interested in it and you, you, you know, um, give your name to Shaheen and I'll make sure, I've, uh, whoever it is, I'll give you uh, information separately on that. Great. We've got a few minutes left. I don't know if there's any last last questions or anything that we haven't managed to address. Um, I think we didn't address the older person with autism, did we? Um, yeah, Lee, Shalina, yeah, that's uh, my son, Zakib. I mean, right. he's obviously, you know, the autism is kind of, speech and language is one element of his autism. Yeah. Um, and his receptive and expressive language. Um, yeah. And, you know, for him, it's very much, you know, the input processing output that you talked about for yeah. him, he needs more time to process so yeah. he can he can take it in and then he won't respond straight away with his output because he's spending a bit more time doing the processing bit. Yes, exactly. um, but he, you know, he's get, he's well supported at the school he's at, um, yeah. which is good. Um, but because his is a bit more complex because he's got the autism as well. So then, you know, it's, it's one of the features of, of, um, the speech and language is one of the features of his autism that, yeah. you know, he finds difficult. Right. But so, I don't have a particular question. It was okay. just, if you've got yeah. any suggestions. Yeah, I mean, um, for, for processing problems, again, I would just say, make things visual, make things concrete, um, and give lots of Makaton, 
uh, for expansion yeah. and output because a Makaton can make a huge difference for children with autism and learning difficulties. Yeah, and it's interesting. We talk about um, when you talked about the metronome. Um, yeah. He yeah. plays the drums. Okay, um, and he's quite. He likes. You know, he's quite musical, and he he yeah. kind of listens to the metronome quite a lot for his okay. drums. So oh, excellent! Like the beat and everything, and it kind of makes sense now why he probably enjoys doing that because it probably ah. helps him mm. um, with his with his listening as well. Yeah, you know, listening is never going to do any harm because, as I said, the base of the pyramid is listening and attention, isn't it? And when when the listening and attention is fragile, the whole pyramid crumbles. It's the foundation for everything, right? You cannot mm. access anything until you've got those channels open for listening and attention. And how do you get them open? Just by practice, practice, practice listening. The drums, by the way, that you mentioned are really deep, they're uh, low frequency sounds, they're yeah. deep tones and they help grounding. Um, and they help you to know where you are, what your body's doing, and it, it makes you very present. The high frequency tones are very good for concentration and for uh, focus. I think related to speech, thank you, by the way, this is really interesting, really great session. Um, just regarding a, a three-year-old, she's, well, three and a bit, and her, her speech has really come on in the last few months, and, you know, she's sort of speaking sentences now, Shoko, which is wonderful, which, which she, you know, if I go back six months, it was almost sort of single words at that time, so, you know, a lot of development. Um, just, just the only thing that kind of struggling now a little bit, um, and it may just be a phase, that's all, but just kind of curious in that her speech has, has developed there and we think we can reason a bit with her. She's extremely resistant um, to kind of just getting changed or clothes and sort of no, 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 running away. And with other things we can kind of reason with her. So we think she does, she does understand a fair amount. I'm just not quite sure why that's a battle at the moment. And maybe it's a phase, I don't know. So you're, you're saying you would like to get a bit more cooperation with daily things and yeah just just it's just a curious one that um when she goes into this no 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 and kind of runs away and and yet with other things she she speaks and seems to understand a lot more but, but with that maybe it's just a phase but... yeah, the previous talk which i think is recorded on how to create a positive language environment where you can get more you know co cooperative behavior Okay. That's that's recorded from last time. Maybe Shaheen, you can send that along to Rahim. I, sure, I can share the, share the link. But Rahim, I wonder is it is it linked to? Um, I wonder whether is it a, a, any particular pattern of when she is non cooperative? You know, is it related to you know I don't know some sort of sensory needs ac to, to, according to what clothes you're putting out, or have you noticed any sort of pattern, or it could actually just be random? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, no, it's just random. It's just just that. I mean, we've got an elder child, so I've seen all this with with, well, with both Rihanna and Samir when they were younger. So, um, no, it, it just seems it just seems pretty um, pretty random. But and I know also when they're emotionally flooded, you just can't you just can't reason and stuff. But, mm. um, but yeah, um, no, it's just it is what it is. For that, really. so, thank you. Great. Thanks, Rahim. Well, I think we will wrap up, but um, thank you all for, for your participation today. I, I am 100% certain that everybody here will have gone away with some tips today. Um, Shalina, as always, you explain things so clearly um, with your vast, vast experience. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your time this evening. So um, thank you to Shalina and thank you to all of you who attended today. Um, and if there is any further information you'd like following on from today's session, um, please just you know dro drop us an email on the um, AKSW email address and um, we can then get back to you with any further queries. Thank you. Thank all you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining.